sitting down and chatting with me. You got, yeah. a, lo you got a lot of knowledge in this financial industry, and I can't wait to pick your brain about this because if anybody can talk about all this information, it's definitely you way over my, my head and things that I couldn't even understand. So I'm excited, and thanks for showing up. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm, I'm excited too. Hopefully I can articulate everything well because, like you said, sometimes it, it goes over my head too and it gets really complicated, and I think the hardest part is – just explaining it in general. Oh, I'm pretty sure you're not going to have a problem with that. Uh, to remind me and for everybody else out there, can you just give us a little bit about who you are, what you do, you, you do, and we'll get into everything that we talked about earlier. Yeah. So yeah, my name is Michael Roth and, um, right now I uh, work at uh, first Republic bank as a, um, suitability and fiduciary risk officer. Um, I'll say two things to that one, any, Financial topics we talk about are purely my opinion. They're not um, uh, necessarily reflect those of the bank. So got to put that out there. And then uh, second, my role, what the heck is a fiduciary suitability officer? Yeah, let's start with um, that because I don't know what that is. Yeah. So so what is that? Um, I like to joke that it's my job to make sure we don't pull any Wells Fargo's. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, really, you know, what risk roles do in the bank is... Um, there is what we call three lines of defense. Uh, the first is the first line. The first line of defense is, you know, like your bank teller, it's your wealth manager, it's, you know, the guy who's, you know, writing up the loan paperwork for you. You know, he should be checking out to make sure, okay, this person is a, you know, safe to give a loan to, or this is a, you know, a, you know, good candidate to, you know, manage money for, or so on and so forth. So that's the first line. Um, the second line is kind of like my role and like compliance. So we're coming in there and we're saying, okay, let's take a look at uh, the, you know, the big picture, you know, on the, the back end and say, hey, you know, the first line, you know, these guys meeting with the clients, they're supposed to be checking all these things. They're supposed to be doing all these things. Are they actually doing them? All right. Right. Got so. It. You know, so for the Wells Fargo example, the second line would be saying, hey, you know, we have these sales policies and procedures in place. Are they actually being followed? Do we have all these client signatures? Do we have all these files on document, you know, on, and documented because things like that. And so the second line develops checks and balances to essentially test the first line and say, hey, um, you know, are we actually following the rules? Are we doing what we're saying we're doing, you know? And then the third line is internal audit, which comes in and just even checks the second line to check everybody to make sure that <laughs> all those, all those procedures, everything are being followed. And then all the, you know, documentation is where it should be. Now, so was that in place before this whole thing went to hell in a handbasket, either between Wells Fargo and that whole scam or the OA crisis? Was this all there? Or just it was and nobody really said anything. We just, hey, if the bank's making money. So um, <laughs> uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, you know, crap on Wells Fargo a little bit. I apologize to, to any Wells Fargo employees here. But um, the three lines of defense for risk should be independent of each other. Um, the first line should, you know, re reports to essentially the C, you know, should go all the way up to the CEO um, and then the uh, second line should go up to also the CEO, but to the um, CRO's chief risk officer. And then, you know, uh, internal audit should, is internal audit should be separate as well. The problem with Wells Fargo is that the second line reported to the first line. Okay. So that's like the student grading himself. Really? It was yeah. that? Hmm. Um, uh, yeah. So th that was the main problem, which was, you know, the second line could have come in and said, hey, I think we see a problem, but the first, but because the first line owns the second line, they were like, well, yeah, but we're doing super well, so, you know, don't say anything, or we'll, you know, like, it's okay, sales are up, like, we'll let this, you know, slide for right now, it doesn't seem to be that big of a problem. So, you know, the issues kind of got pushed under the table because the, the first line was controlling the second line, the line was supposed to be doing the checks and the testing. Um, and I hate to say this, but that's, that still hasn't changed at Wells Ugh. Fargo. They, they've said, you know, this is where I said, I'm going to crap on Wells Fargo. They said, you know, you know, new bank, new policies, new so on and so forth. But, um, their second line still reports up to the first line. The cat's out the bag now. Everybody's yeah. going to know that. <laughs> so whenever someone's like, oh yeah, I Wells Fargo. I'm just like, oh, oh this, man, you should come to First Republic. <laughs> oh, what a sales pitch for the new company. Now, see? Throw the O and under the bus. Actually, this is a good thing to talk about, too, because this is such a niche 
career that you're in. This isn't something that I think people think about when they go, go to college. You know, I'm going to be a fiduciary and I'm going to do this and that. You probably maybe think about getting into the financial industry because of how lucrative it can be. How did you fall into this specific job here? Not specifically this company, but this specific role that you've been in for a while. Um, uh, you know, I'd like to say that there was this epiphany and suddenly this career path opened or something, <laughs> but um, it was really, I just didn't like my previous job. And, um, uh, you know, I won't talk about that, but um, I didn't like my previous job. Uh, First Republic offered me a job and uh, that was that. You know, I, I kind of jumped into the role and I, I honestly did not know much about it, kind of like most people. Um, but I did have a finance degree and I did have a background in trading. And so my boss is like, great, I don't have anything, you know, I don't really have a background in trading. Uh, you know, Mike's pretty good with technology and um, he has a degree in finance. So he's going to, you know, know all the jargon to fit right in here. So that was that, you know. Pretty straightforward, huh? Yeah. Wow. So. And I'm sure we'll, we'll delve deep into this whole thing in a little, little bit, but really quickly, just a sidestep on that one. Is this a career you would recommend for people coming out of college now with everything changing, not just specifically your role, but in the industry and what maybe people are being prepared for as far as what they're coming into with their knowledge base. And then now it's kind of a different thing or what you think about the industry and how safe it can be. Maybe it is, but here's the other side of the equation. Yeah, um, I would say my role is a niche role, and um, it's also not that big of a role because um, uh, mostly larger institutions need someone in my role to help manage things. Um, mm -hmm. And then a lot of times my specific role might get um, pushed into compliance. So my role is, is very similar to compliance. In fact, a lot of my stuff, we work side by side with compliance. Um, so, but I think risk management in general is for people coming out of college is definitely um, like a career choice that I would say, hey, you know, like huge hedge funds, all these guys, like maybe it's not specifically my role, but all of them need some form of risk management. You like all good companies have a department or a little group of people somewhere that are saying, you know, knock, knock, um, this might not be the greatest <laughs> idea or have you taken a look at this yet? You know? And so, you know, there's, cause the larger you get, it's, uh, it's essentially, uh, the, the larger a company gets, the more opportunities and the more places there become where things might get overlooked. And it's essentially our job to make sure that nothing gets overlooked and that we're, you know, we have, you know, full visibility into the business and what's happening so that, you know, when regulators or internal audit or anybody comes by, we can say, yeah, no, we've got everything together and everything is safe. And not only that, but we can prove it. I got to tell you, it just sounds stressful to be in that, that role, because if you don't catch something, I'm not saying this will be in your company or you, but somebody's head's going to be on the chopping block. And would you be the first one that they say that was your job to catch it? Therefore, you're not doing something or whatnot. I guess the bigger picture with that is it used to be when you wanted to work on Wall Street, 90s, 80s, especially before everything really crashed. And that was it, was it Dark Tuesday or whatever that Tuesday was that got famous in the 80s. Uh, it used oh, to be Black Monday. Was it Black Monday? Yeah. The one Black from Monday, that movie. It the was. Wolf the Wolf of Wall Street, that, uh, that first scene when he's with Matthew McConaughey and then the place just shuts down. Yeah, yeah, that was the day where the market, I think it dropped 24% in a single day, still the largest single day drop. Um, yeah, I think in total, there was like two, two. I mean, that quote unquote market crash or recession was two, was two days. <laughs> it was the Monday, I think the following Tuesday was also down and then from that point onward, it recovered but the entire crash just happened in a day. And yeah, it's, it's, I don't know that much about it, like, but I do know that essentially it had to do with the dollar, like, I, I, I think the basics of it was it had to do with the dollar being overvaluated and then there was a like, most market issues stem from a liquidity issue, which yeah. is where people don't think they're gonna get their money or something like that and then they freak out and then that's the huge yeah. reactions. But yeah, that was, 
Well, that brings up another conversation we can get to later about the dollar being overvaluated, which we look at how things are looking now. But getting back into it, this used to be a career where everybody wanted to get into. It was, I'm going to get a degree. I'm going to go work on Wall Street. I'll work for the big banks, Chase, Wells Fargo, uh, Bank of America. And it's going to be a super fun career. I'll make a lot of money and I'm going to go up the chain of command and devote my whole life to that. You start seeing over time that, you know, the... The flair of it, while if you're really good with, with, with numbers, it can be very exciting, but there's another side of working in a corporation like that. Sometimes it can be cutthroat, can it? Just with uh, not so much just making numbers, but also just, you know, if, you don't, if you're not on top of your game, the next person in line is going to be right there to say, uh-huh, I can take over with that. Has that feeling sort of changed in the industry? Has it been tampered down? It's like, nope, still there. Still I think something where to think I about. am, it's not an issue, but is it? Is it still in the industry? Like, absolutely. The industry uh, is still very, it can be still very cutthroat. Um, it, you know, definitely people trying to jump over other people, you know, to try to make it to success. Um, I would say, you know, it, it's funny because when people talk about wealth, and I don't know if you ever want to go down this road, but, you know, like, you know, there's like the 1%. I also think there's the 1% in the finance industry because most financial positions and jobs, like they'll pay decent, mm -hmm. but you're not like making a ton of money right out of college. You have to pay a lot of dues. Um, you know, you're, you're not making like serious money until you're like in your forties kind of thing. Like, you know, it's, it's this, um, uh, you know, um, convex kind of curved, salary role where you're like you start off kind of low there are some companies you know or right off the bat like if you get a job at Goldman right off the bat like you're doing pretty well and you're you're starting uh, you know pay is pretty high but even at even at places like Goldman and things like that where the starting pay is high uh sure you get like you know a raise throughout the year you might get a bonus that kind of thing but your your salary kind of does like this for the first few years I'm not sure if the camera's seeing it but you start off with this slow upward progression and then it's kind of like as soon as you make it into like a management role or a VP role or something like that, suddenly your salary goes boom and you start skyrocketing up. And then, then you have you know those people where you have that vim that vision of the finance industry where someone's making like 500k a year or something like that. It's it's long, hard for a really long time. And then you know you get that one step up, and once you've paid your dues, then it then it yeah. yeah becomes quite lucrative depending on where you are yeah that half a million dollar executive salary that's the poster child it's like you want to be in this career look how much you can make all you got to do is put your dues in and we weren't going to tell you how long that's going to take or how many hours you're going to put in but hey if you put the time in you know, that, that could be you one day uh, a lot of time yeah <laughs> uh i just don't i have respect for everybody in the in, in the industry like you because that's a lot. I'm sure it's a lot of math. It's not just the numbers as far as, you know, what this person says and that. It's a lot of crunching the numbers in terms of long multiplication division tables that I haven't done since probably high school, maybe early college. That's like the, the extent of what I wanted to, to, to deal with. So to be able to actually sit there and do that and enjoy it, that takes a lot from somebody. And, you know, more power to you, first of all, for being able to tolerate a lot of that because <laughs> that, that would drive me crazy. If there's anybody in college listening to this, thinking about getting into the, the industry, I would say what you need today is not only those, you know, those good math skills and the curiosity and everything like that, but um, also to be able to code, um, have SQL in our skills, because the finance industry today is a digital in industry. And so if you don't know how to put together some, you know, a basic, you know, SQL or basic Python script or something like that, then um, a lot of employers kind of like require that these days because most of um, most analysis is done with like quote unquote big data and big data does not fit on an Excel sheet. So it coding is this been this big thing the last maybe the last decade or shorter than than that. It's like if you can code whatever that means to me, you're pretty much, you know, a golden ticket to get somewhere because that apparently is such a tough skill to get and it takes a lot of just. I can't even think of the right word of knowledge of how to work through a computer system and be able to create certain things that the company needs, the algorithms, the uh, instant uh, results that you need to be able to get ahead of the competition. It's a, uh, it's, 
that's a very tough need needs to get into. Yeah. I mean, I, I just think it's, if you wanted to get into the finance industry, that's going to be your biggest step up over your peers is, is having that knowledge because, um, you know, we have super smart coders over at first Republic, but I remember, um, one time where we were making, um, a dashboard, um, that was going to kind of just display some of our options exposure. And, you know, I had to hop on a phone call with some of our developers over in India and they were asking me what an option is because <laughs> they're coders. They, they don't have a finance background, right? That makes sense. So, yeah. I mean, and I don't expect that from them. Um, but that's the thing is if you're going to go work at a financial institution and you have like a coding background, that's really helpful because me, I'm able to, able to help them write the code and explain everything to them. And that's, you know, I think what would give me what, you know, would give me or anyone who's graduating from college an edge in the current market is say, oh, yeah, I know I can I can write that code for you. You don't have to explain this to someone who's a contractor or, um, you know, like, a, you know, a, a contract firm that you've employed to help build X, Y, Z. You know, you can just kind of come and say, oh, no, no, I can. I can write this for you or I can help out to make sure that the tool or whatever product you want to develop actually gets developed the way you want. There we go. I think we talked about this earlier before the cameras rolling, but the big shift that you're seeing now in the industry, is it really crypto? Is that the way everything is going now? You know, we're supposed to jump on that and say Bitcoin and Dogecoin all the way. <laughs> oh. <laughs> it, yeah. So I think there should be this huge distinction between cryptocurrency um, or especially like, you know, Bitcoin and then blockchain. There is a difference because there's this huge, there's this huge difference. One is, you know, the digital currency, which I keep pointing out to people is, is not tied to anything. And they're all like, yeah, that's what's so great about it. It's not tied to anything. And I'm like, cool. So the value of it is literally what people say it's valued at which is why Bitcoin was $20,000 and then it drops down to $5,000, whatever the, you know, the, the cost. It's uh, pure speculation. You speculate what the price is going to be worth because you have nothing to tie it to as an example. Um, U.S. dollar, right, you can tie it to other currencies. You can tie it to specific goods and how much they cost. Um, you can tie it to inflation and things like that. So, like, there's a lot of calculations, metrics, formulas, things like that, where you can, you can put in to calculate what the value of a, um, normal currency, like the dollar or the Euro or the yen or anything like that, what they're going to be worth. Um, but for cryptocurrency, there is no necessarily any defined formula. So you just kind of have to speculate on the price. And so, you know, when it comes to investing in cryptocurrencies, um, whether a hedge fund do it or whether you have it at your, you know, on Acorn or whatever, you know, those, you know, app, uh, um, what's the big one? Um, which one, which currency? No, no, no. The, the, the big trading app that everyone Robin uses. Robinhood. Robinhood. There yeah. we go. Thank you. I, I just blanked on that. Yeah. Whether you're, you're trying to trade it on Robinhood or something like that, um, you know, we would consider that in the speculative investments because, it doesn't fall under a traditional asset class. We wouldn't put it under currency because it's not backed by a government or any goods or anything. So it's literally its own asset class over there in its corner. And because it's its own asset class, um, you know, usually when it comes to asset classes for someone's portfolio, we'll say, hey, you know, you got your equity, like your stocks, you got your fixed income, your bonds. Um, you have some things that are like alternatives, which alternatives we would say are like combinations so, you know, alternative can be, you know, like if the stock market drops a whole lot, right, you've essentially have a security that says, well, if the stock market drops, this security is going to go up or it's only going to go down a certain amount, so on and so forth. You know, like there's protection built into it. Those are alternatives. But alternatives are um, based on an existing asset class like equities or the fixed income or something like that. It's just, you know, like they're just mo alternatives are just modified versions of other asset classes. Right. Um, burst, but you know, cryptocurrency is not a modified version of another asset class. It's, it's completely different. So it's completely speculative. Yeah, it's completely speculative. You know, alternatives are not speculative. They're tied. They're always tied to something. Um, yeah, so what's common like, asset classes like property and what we call materials, like literally gold and right, things yeah. like that. Hard, actual Hard, assets actual that you can see. Actual things that you can see. 
Well, what's the path then, honestly? Is there a path that one day these cryptocurrencies will actually be tied to something that will give them legitimacy in the market? Right now, it's all like, it could be this, it could not be that, but what's it going to take to actually make it happen? Is it a government coming in, stepping in, say, we back it, therefore... Well, you if know, you back a cryptocurrency, then it becomes a normal currency. It's not like a cryptocurrency anymore. It'd be like, you know, because the U.S. dollar is practically digital. Think about it. Yeah. What was it like? You use credit cards, you use Venmo. When was that time when we actually used like, you know, you very rarely actually use cash. Yeah, it's all Apple Pay now and Yeah, exactly. Pay. So, I mean, the U.S. dollar is essentially a digital currency as well. I never thought of it that it, way. It, You're right, but I never thought of it that you way. You know, like, it, currency these days is completely digital. It's just this one's not tied to anything. So it had to be somebody, some government with legitimacy, whether it's us, China, or whoever, Canada, saying that, this is our currency lay of the land and that changes the whole game. But until somebody does that, it's like, it's just going to keep floating in limbo until somebody decides to put their name on it. Or Elon says, Hey, we'll be accepting Bitcoin one day for Tesla. I don't even know if he's still doing that. If that was just a marketing gig. Uh, but it would have to take somebody saying, we're going to put our foot out there take the big risk and say, we're going to back this thing up for the, di- the, the dominoes to actually roll. You think? Yeah. I mean, I think the biggest thing is, um, for you to own something, you have to have control over it. Nobody has control over cryptocurrency, mm-hmm. um, right? Like the the amount of cryptocurrency that, you know, say Bitcoin, when you mine Bitcoin, um, you're increasing the number of Bitcoins in the population. So that's a built-in inflation. Um, so um, having that built-in inflation and not t- necessarily tying it to anything like a government, like the U.S. says we're going to print X, Y, Z dollars, right? So they they are controlling the amount of money that's in and out, and that's also why you know you can calculate the value of a dollar. As you can say, well, there's only this many dollars out there right now, um, and or you know the U.S. government's putting more dollars out there, so maybe that's going to deflate the value of the dollar, so on and so forth. And other countries get to do that. Cryptocurrencies don't get to suddenly say, oh, we're going to pump XYZ crypto, you know, XYZ more Bitcoin into, you know, the pool. That's that function is not built in. Hmm. So um, so because cryptocurrency can't technically be controlled, it, you can't necessarily tie it to anything or a government can't say, oh, we own this. A government could say they own this and they're going to use a cryptocurrency, which would be kind of cool. Um, but if a country did do that, it would probably be a country, you know, a third world country that needs a stable currency. What do they got to lose at that point in a way? Exactly. So, you know, if you have like a country like any of this, you know, like Zimbabwe or something, exactly where, you know, the conversion rate is one us dollar to like 10,000 of their Zimbabwe dollars. I, I, whatever that one is. Yes. I, I forget what that currency would probably be. Um, but for a lot of countries, right, their currency is unstable because their government's unstable, right? Their government's going to pay for whatever it's doing by printing a huge amount of that currency, and suddenly that currency loses all value because if, you know, if you're just going to print it out and hand it out like it's, you know, candy kind of thing, then yeah. what's it really worth? So that's why, that's where, where Bitcoin originated was in a lot of these third world countries where they were using Bitcoin. It was an uncentralized currency in in a lot of those countries everyone does all their transactions with their phones so they were just sending bitcoin and stuff with their phones and doing it that way because they're like yeah you know like if we can't use our country's currency we just need to find another one and the u.s dollar is too expensive actually to even get our hands on right so we just have to we have to create our own thing and that's why uh bitcoin became so popular especially in um the uh you know uh underworld markets yeah because guess where a lot of underworld goods are coming from places like south africa and that's where they're using bitcoin and exchanging that currency because their currency is too unstable it's a good way to put it never thought about that but what's the difference between that and blockchain currency right or blockchain so blockchain is the software behind it and that's the concept that all transactions are unique so you can't so, – so things like fraud, right, um, hacking into someone's bank account and transferring out the assets, like that's very difficult to do. Or, you know, like manipulating a bank account or something like that, you know, suddenly adding money to an account where the money didn't exist before, that kind of thing. I mean, there's checks and balances in place right now, but that literally can't be done in Bitcoin. The, um, 
the currency has to come from somewhere, right? It, it can't be created except through the mining process. Um, hmm. But I mean, that's so essentially there, there are no duplicate accounts or anything like that. And it makes um, hacking accounts like almost impossible. Um, and so I think I forget which country it is. I want to say it's like it's one of the Baltic countries. Um, but the, Estonia, one of the biggest, Latvia. Yeah, um, it's one of the Baltic countries, and Lithuania is the other one. Yeah, it might be Lithuania, um, and they decided to use blockchain for their real estate market because a lot of people were duplicating um, deeds of ownership for property. Hmm. and selling a property that wasn't actually theirs. It was that easy to do? Because, I, I mean, you just copy a number, right? You, you print out a piece of paper, and it's forged kind of thing, and then you bring it to a bank, or you, you, know, you sell it to somebody, and they have that deed, and they go, oh, great, you know, and it gets filed kind of thing. And the original owner, right, like their, their current system wasn't really, you know, it was very easy to kind of like maybe even forge a prior sell. How did um, they let that happen? How does that even... That sounds so simple to do, to forge a deed and just say, hey, Chase Bank, this is my property. Give me a loan on something else. That just sounds so simple that you would think they would be able to catch that. Or is there more going on there in that country well, that we didn't know about? I mean, probably the infrastructure wasn't so great to start with, but they saw blockchain and they went, oh, great. Like the transfer of property where you can't duplicate properties or anything like that, right? Each property has its own unique ID and right. there's no way of frauding that essentially so they converted to a blockchain system for property wow that's okay so is that is that what's behind a lot of the hedge funds nowadays who are saying we're, we're, we're kind of getting into this game now we, we think we can this is going to be something one day they're more on the blockchain side than the cryptocurrency side or are they do both now i would say the blockchain portion of it it which is the software portion has its applications and we're starting to see that enter the financial industry. Um, cryptocurrencies, I feel like one of the reasons why hedge funds like it is one, it's speculative and hedge funds are all about the speculative, you know, like trying to create wealth where, you know, it previously didn't exist. That's like the point of hedge funds is create wealth. Didn't work for them on GameStop. <laughs> no, that it did not. <laughs> um, so, I mean, that's one of the reasons I know why, uh, cryptocurrency is popular at first republic right now is we just have clients asking for it i mean if there's demand for it there's so there's demand for it. like people it. are very interested in it you know even though i might sit here and i might say that's a really bad idea i would invest in that if i were you you know like there are so many more traditional classic ways of slowly growing wealth than trying to bet on some literally bet on something um do you think that, that, that that's more of the hype in the media or maybe it's this whole underlying faith in the dollar with all this money we've been printing the last two years and we're at I don't even know how much money we've been printing so far but it's like obviously the most we've ever done in history and where when are we yeah. going to fall off the cliff and do I need something else that maybe might be more stable quote unquote I, I think the whole thing is attractive about crypto, uh, cryptocurrency is the fact that it's decentralized you know so there's a lot of people who have distrust in the government Trump got elected that's a whole how yeah. do you think he got <laughs> elected people who have distrust in the government right mm -hmm. and they wanted something new um so if you, if you think about it really there is this huge market out there for um things that are uh blank in a sense so they're um so cryptocurrency right it's not tied to a government so that's that's cool um you know, it's decentralized, but at the same time, there are a lot of people and investors out there who don't want to invest in companies that do animal testing. There's a lot of people out there who don't want to invest in uh, quote unquote big corporations, right? They're anti big corporation. They want that mom and pop shop. There's all these anti people and cryptocurrency is the anti everything because it is nothing. It is literally nothing. So if wow. you're that person who is like anti everything and you're that Gen Z or you're that millennial who is like, screw the world, cryptocurrency is like your investment. It's this per, it was like the perfect cluster. Now, is there enough? Okay. If enough people did that, again, the generation after us, if enough people did that, 
would that would that be enough to move the the, the needle, or eventually we're going to come back to the same thing we're doing now, which is what backs this this up? <laughs> you know, um, amazingly, I think cryptocurrency will, will always have its place because of that demand. Mm. Um, but it's really a demand based on what's happening at the time. I haven't done this research, but I would assume that the more unrest there is in the world, um, you know, like during the times of uh, George Floyd and things like that, where there's a lot of unrest and there's a lot of hate and anger and things like that going around. I would, I have to go back and look at the numbers, but I would assume that's probably when cryptocurrency is doing its best because when people are kind of like anti-establishment or anti-system, whatever the case, that's probably where the most investment into cryptocurrency would go is they want to they want to throw it there. These days, though, since hedge funds and a lot of bigger companies are interested in cryptocurrency, whenever hedge funds and big companies become interested in something, then the amount of, you know, then it used to be that, you know, you and I could move the needle on the price of cryptocurrency. Mm -hmm. But once big investors and big players enter the market and the currencies become more liquid and things like that, well, then it suddenly it's, you know, if I was to throw a thousand dollars into cryptocurrency, I'm throwing a drop into you know the ocean kind of thing. You know? Literally, so, yeah. Um, so then it, you know it doesn't make a, a big a splash anymore. So I, I feel like um, cryptocurrency, the 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 big swings, like whether it's going to get the twenty thousand and so on and so forth, would probably either be tied to a lot of um, unrest problems with existing currencies or shifts in generation. That might be it. I think those, you know, the, the days where cryptocurrency goes from nothing to 20,000 is big. Uh, is that you? Yeah. There, we, there go. we go. Okay. The shifts where um, cryptocurrency goes from, you know, nothing to 20,000 in the course of a few months, that's not going to happen again. That was the first initial hype, and that won't happen again. Fair enough. I can say that pretty confidently. You know, you brought up the hedge fund thing, and it's not just with cryptocurrency. We're seeing a lot of these hedge funds now in – the way that they're getting the real estate market, which they've always been, but now it seems like now it's a whole new beast now because of, well, you know, with the, especially over here with all of our home prices out here, million dollars for something built in 1950 with nothing done to it. And it's like, why not we just dump money into these, into these new homes here because we can buy them up and they're just going to keep on going up and add that to our portfolio. You got any thoughts on that? You know, part of me wants, California's real estate market to um, experience a bubble because it's so absurd. But I'm a homeowner, so I also don't want a bubble. <laughs> yeah, I think um, I think well, California be in it for twenty years and then it'll come back. I, I yeah right. Um, I think <laughs> no offense, but the California people and the California market is just too stubborn for a bubble. Um, but what I do uh, think will happen is we've seen this massive jump over the last few months, you know, like starting 2020. Yeah. Uh, tap it one more time. Did you go? Oh, there we go. Yeah. It I doesn't guess, like it when you tap the table. Yeah, yeah, I, I told should not you touch the it. table. <laughs> um, so starting 2020, right, um, everyone came out of the pandemic and they were like, this is the year I buy a house or this is the year we move away, right? We have our tiny little San Francisco studio, 2020, you know, one new year. I'm going to like, get out there, I'm going to buy houses and real estate prices like shot up, like at least, I don't have the exact number, but I feel like they went up at least 20% in like suburbs and a lot of other places. They just skyrocketed as soon as, you know, the, the new year began. Um, and one of the things that really fueled that was the thought that interest rates were so low and being as low as they are, there's, I mean, unless, federal rates go negative, which I doubt will happen. Uh, interest rates only have one direction to go. <laughs> it's yeah. up. So if you're like, well, I, I'm going to buy, buy, you know, if I'm going to buy a house now. Sure. Houses are really expensive and you know, the, the price tag is really high, but the overall cost of what you'll have to spend on the, at the end of the day between a two to 3% interest rate and like a four or 5% interest rate, is pretty significant like over time and even i'm at you know like if you have a million dollar um if you have a if you're buying a million dollar home right the difference between that three percent and the four percent is that one percent right so one percent of a million you're looking at okay that's an extra ten thousand dollars in interest rates you have to pay every year 
So, you know, if you bought a $1,200 or sorry, $1.2 million home, essentially that's an extra thousand dollars a month. That's just, you know, in your mortgage as interest. Gotcha. So yep. if you think about your paycheck and you go, well, do I want to wait a couple months and pay an extra, you know, $1,000, you know, dollars a month on my mortgage? <laughs> You're like, no, I don't. So I'm going to buy the house now. I'd rather, you know, buy the house for a premium than, you know, and, and pay for that house than have to pay all of the interest. And that's just going to go to the bank. So that's why a lot of people are buying homes right now is because interest rates are so low. And as interest rates go up, right, suddenly people with the current, you know, housing prices are not going to be able to afford them, which means that housing prices will not go up anymore. But I think they're just going to stay. I don't think they're going to drop. If they do drop, it's going to be very tiny. I think they're just going to stay stagnant. Like I said, I think the California market and the people are just too stubborn to, to lower their prices. But what they are going to do is they're just going to hold. So if you said what's going to happen to the California real estate market over the next few years, my speculation would be like very, will grow, yes, but like very minimal growth. We're talking like that 2 to 3% growth, which is what's normal in other states. Right. Um, but So the old mindset of, I can go find a fixer upper for a couple hundred thousand dollars, fix it up and rent it out and flip it. That's long gone around here. Unless you find oh a diamond man. in the rough and you have that one person you get at the right time. I mean, I've, I mean, every model, uh, oh. there we go. Yeah. Are you back? Are you back? All right. He's uh that one's finicky right now. That mic. Try it again. How about, there we go. There we go. Um, I just remodeled my home with my wife and before that I had a condo and I remodeled that as well. And so having remodeled twice now, I don't, I don't know how anybody makes money flipping. <laughs> um, but, um, yeah, I mean, there, there's definitely deals out there. Um, and I, I guess I do know how people make money flipping is to go to Home Depot and they, buy the thing that's on sale and that's what they throw inside the house i yeah i, I know if, i know whenever you're looking at houses like you know a flip because you've seen that chandelier at home depot or you've seen that chandelier on sale on wayfair yeah you know that kind of thing yep. like yep. because people watch the all those flipping shows you know like the property brothers things like that which i, I love those guys um, and they go to Home Depot, they, they hop on Wayfair because it's so advertised and things like that. And they just get all those basic items and they throw it in. And, you know, so I walk into a bathroom I'm like, oh, yeah, that's that's a $100 vanity from Home Depot. I saw that at Home and Garden Television. That's what they were doing. OK. Yeah. So it's like, I know what that I know. I've seen that vanity before. That's like a, it's a super simple, you know, $100 vanity from Wayfair or Home Depot. And does now it look good? Sure. But, you know, it's like. Now, is it me or those shows you don't see them as much anymore? Those flipper home improvement shows. Oh, they're they're still there. They're I'm, still there. Oh, HGTV is like just nothing but that. But um, same same thing with Property Brothers. Like the number of times you're going to see them flip a home in the Bay Area. Yeah, they're like, we're not touching this place. We're going to go everywhere else in the, <laughs> the country. The Bay Area for... is not where you flip a home. They're in freaking Alabama. They're yeah. in all these other, yeah, they're, they're all, they're in these places where, one, the cost of goods is so much cheaper and the cost of labor is so much cheaper because California is, you know, insane. Um, and then um, not only that, but they're in the place where it's like, yeah, we bought the home. I, Sometimes I, I see that and like they're they're. I, I get so upset because they're like, we bought this five bedroom, four bathrooms, got a movie theater, it's huge, and it only costs us three hundred thousand. And I'm like, oh no, uh, get out of here! A, what? Like if that were here, it's like cash offer right now. Here's twenty thousand over. Give me the house for three hundred thousand over here. You yeah. cannot even. That's not why. Even that's why there. a lot of people in a lot of other states just like get so upset when Californians move anywhere else. Because Californians come in and we're like, yeah, we'll pay cash for that. Absolutely. You're like, I'll, I'll, I'll just, what was the asking price? You know, like uh, there's states where you were, ask, were bidding the asking price isn't common. California is one of the very few states where I think going like 10, 20% over the asking price is like a norm. Wow. Right. That doesn't exist anywhere else. We're so numb to it here. You know, like, like everywhere else. Wow. And in other states, if you ask, if you give them asking, they're like, Whoa, we got asking like 
that's great. You know, like, so that doesn't exist in a lot of other places. So for California to just come in and be like, yeah, I'll, I'll give you asking for that. They're just like, oh, sure. So there you go. Bye. Well, that's going to be me. I'm going to be one of those Californians that goes to another state and says, sorry, I can buy a couple of homes over here cash, but I can't even afford a fixer upper in my state. So, you know, well, you yeah, know, you're going to hate me. There you go. I think, uh, I, I don't know if you know this. Well, I mean, you know, you knew my dad was a police officer, um, but one, did, of his, yes. one of his partners, um, when he retired from the police force, he took his you know, pension and he, and this was a long time ago, um, but um, he moved to Connecticut and bought that four bedroom or, you know, five bedroom, four bathroom home with his own man cave kind of thing. Did it come and with a butler? No, it did not come with a butler, but you know, like, and he's got like a nice separate garage for his, you know, for his bikes and things like that and whatever. That would be the thing is when you retire to the, the, the state, just head on over to a tax free state or a state tax free state. Because even though you're paying more in property taxes, like in Texas, percentage wise, the dollar amount is nothing compared to what we have to pay here. Yeah. This is just no. one thing that I think is unique and it, which is one of the reasons why California real estate is so expensive, though, is we, um, as far as I'm concerned, we're the only state that locks in cost basis. Meaning so, what? So if I buy a house for a million dollars um my the value of my property you know to the state can only go up i think it's two or three percent max a year which they always do they always raise your property value by those two or three percent um but if i buy a house in seattle and suddenly real estate prices are on, on average have gone up by 10 percent in seattle they're going to change the cost basis of my home. They're going to increase the value of my home by 10%. So my property taxes went up by 10%. And yeah, you were looking in Seattle, weren't you? <laughs> I, I looked, I, I looked <laughs> yeah. everywhere. Um, but that's one of the things is suddenly if you're, the area you're living in increases in value, right, your property taxes will increase in value as appropriately. So one of the things people know in California is I buy my, I buy my home and – whatever my you know whatever the taxes i'm are i'm paying sure it's going to go up like a little bit each year you know that two or three three percent each year but that's it you know that's why um you know like one of the things i love is if you have if your parents or your grandparents or something bought a home in california back in like the 60s i think my grandmother she when her home um they bought in the 40s and when she passed away and we had to get it revalued, um, the original cost basis for the home, I think, was like 175000 And it was a, a fairly decently sized home and sold for 10 times that kind of thing. But, you know, I think they bought it back in the 40s for like 50000 and so I mean, since then, it had only appreciated to the point of 175 or something like that. And so they were paying the taxes on a property valued at 175 Jesus, you know. You'd have told them back then, this is what's, what's going to happen. You should probably buy a house. Say, okay. I, can oh, de- yeah. <laughs> the, that, I knew somebody who, she worked at Nordstrom for her career. And, you know, up until recently, I mean, you know, having a retail job for 30 years wasn't uncommon. A lot of people did that. Macy's, Bloomingdale's, oh, yeah. all that thing like that. She pulled enough of her money together and she bought a really nice home. At the time, it was a nice home in the Los Altos Hills. So for people that don't know, it's up in the Silicon Valley Hills near Stanford. So pristine real estate, all the Mm. venture capitalists, Elon's Mm -hmm. probably got a home up there and whatnot. I think she bought it for a couple hundred thousand. You know, she put her down payment down and got it. What do you think happened to it after everything happened in Silicon Valley? Explode. I think it's like five or six million now. I mean- ridiculous I mean, talk about getting lucky you yeah. know you you think about it in, in per, per, per perspective somebody having a simple blue collar job honest living working at retail spending a long career there and they're able to get that in hindsight it's like wow you got people now who are in making two three hundred thousand dollars and they still can't afford that home now my my aunt just moved out of the bay and um she uh had a home in the los altos hills and it just so happened that they built a uh Tesla office, like a big Tesla office, I want to say, or like a research center or something, five minutes from her house. <laughs> wow. 
saw the value of her property went through the roof. I mean, not only was she close to like, you know, everything down there, but the fact that she was just so close, to like all of, if you, when you visited her, like and you drove by, like all of her neighbors had like a Tesla in their driveway kind of thing. Cause so did she become all Tesla place. So did she become her favorite nephew at that point? <laughs> knowing what the house was, was worth. All of a sudden you started showing up more often. <laughs> she, hey. has, she has her own kids. Uh, but uh, uh, yeah, it, it was pretty, fu- it was, it was funny. So when she went to sell it, um, she got over, she got over her asking, um, by a lot because I guess it was two Tesla employees were duking it out. I would believe it. Throwing money that they don't even see. Like, you know, I got all my, my, my shares here and this and that. Like, this yeah. is the game that we're playing now. Well, Mike, this is a very interesting career to get into. And just talking to you about the, the numbers, about everything is just, even though I knew a lot about it, right, this is still beyond me. But with that being, being said, with all the time that you spend between your wife, your home, and work, do you guys have time to go travel? Or will you have time to go travel now that everything's opened up? Um, well, yeah, as, as things open up, we will travel more. We want to travel more. We've been cooped up for far too long. All right. um, now, are you big into this whole thing now that's going on with these? Do you play that credit card game? Do you know about all the points and the benefits and how to do all that stuff? Are you one of those? Are you one I, of those? You know, I, I honestly just have two credit cards. I, I, I simple don't, man, good. I, I'm incredibly simple. You know, one I use for restaurants and travel. The other one I use for everything else. Well, know? good for and, you. And I and I do try to you know cash up my miles. Um, you know, I think. I think I only pay for like one out of uh, every like, or you know, I would say maybe like two out of five flights I actually pay for. The rest See? I buy on you know discounted miles kind of thing. That's incredible, man! I just started getting into that whole thing now because all these credit card companies are throwing all these good deals out. Because guess what? A lot of people did during the pandemic that nobody thought about. They were paying off their credit card debt. Yeah. All of a sudden, banks were like. Hey, that money maker that we had that was just going to go on forever, all of a sudden it's starting to dry up. We need more customers. And they start throwing all these offers out there. And I was like, I never wanted a new credit card for a long time. And I started seeing what was showing up. I'm like, wow, this is pretty, this is pretty good. You pay like a $200 annual fee and you get like $2,000 in value back if you play your cards right. Yeah. Um, yeah, that there's definitely benefits to be had there if cards are used appropriately. I think if you have too many cards, it's kind of maybe too difficult to like yeah, <laughs> use all the benefit appropriately or you're spending too much then, <laughs> um, which is why I only have two. Um, but, um, you know, that is one thing that I find really interesting because you got a lot of people out there who they kind of wonder like, well, why did the stock market bounce back so quickly, you know, for, from the pandemic and all these other things, you know, and why are some people saying the economy is doing very well when you have people who, you know, lost their jobs due to COVID or are still struggling, X, Y, Z. Um, there is definitely a huge portion, portion especially of, the, of the, the working class that did lose their jobs and did have this, this big struggle. Um, and then you have, the, but then you also have the opposite which was this huge portion of people who kept their jobs, just worked remotely or something like that. And since they weren't doing anything, like you said, they just paid off all their credit card debt. And so one of the things that's kind of interesting during the pandemic was us trying to figure out like, okay, well, you know, like how bad can this be or how long will this last? And the answer was, well, when things quote unquote clear up, it's not going to last that long because we're seeing all of this excess spending, all this credit card debt and things going down and, you know, for a lot of financial experts, we're just kind of like, okay, we have this giant pool of cash that is just being, it's just waiting to be spent when things open up. So now I feel like every restaurant, every store has a hiring sign on it. Yeah. Um, might not be the job you want, but <laughs> every store Start has somewhere. like almost every store. Oh, you told me about I'll this. I'll do that. <laughs> Um, almost every store has, you know, a f- hiring sign on it. And, um, it's because, um, 
we knew there was all this crazy pent up demand. And as soon as things cleared up, that demand was going to come rushing and flooding in essentially all at the same time, which is also why there's this big inflation scare right now. And people are like, oh, inflation is going to go through the roof, so on and so forth, because all these goods are piled up. When, when I was remodeling, uh, when, I was, when I was doing a remodel, my contractor was like, dude, this is insane. A piece of uh, plywood. A two by four. You know, I, I, you know, I think this is like the, the killer. A piece of plywood, right? Eight foot by four foot piece of plywood. When, when I was young, I did a I, you know, worked construction over my summers, and um, I used to sometimes get sent to Home Depot to pick up some plywood. And I think I could buy plywood, some some forms of decent, you know, structural plywood. I think it was like nine dollars a sheet of plywood. Reasonable. Um, you know. If you'd asked me how much plywood was like a couple of years ago, I would have said probably like due to inflation and other things like, you know, nine to $15 per sheet of plywood. And now I think it's about right. Um, my contractor was telling me that a single sheet of plywood was $80. It was inflation real or is that just me? It's, it's not just, it's, it's, it's supply and demand. There was low demand because every, well, I mean, there was a consistent supply. I mean, the supply dropped a little bit due to COVID, but Really, everyone said, I'm going to remodel. Or I'm going to use all this saved up money at the same time. So demand just skyrocketed. And so there's this huge demand. Supply didn't change. right? So the prices went through the roof. Now I went back to Home Depot and plywood's down to 25 bucks. Mm -hmm. So it's already decreased. right? So that tells me right off the bat it's not inflation. Because if it's inflation, it sticks. Good point. Or just for that. But how about other goods? Um, Food, for example. I mean, yeah. But I... Uh, well, food, there's always a level of inflation for, um, and I think probably we saw the biggest increase in inflation in a lot of food because people are doing a lot of home cooking and things like that. Um, you go to a restaurant, your meal's portioned. You go buy food from the grocery store, you're like, yeah, I'm going to buy a big bundle of carrots to save money, right? So, the, you know, like, um, so yes, I think there's always going to be inflation, um, but I don't think there's necessarily going to, I don't think it's going to like skyrocket or go to hyperinflation or do some crazy thing where suddenly our bottled water is like $12 or something crazy like that. I, it's really just, there's this huge pent up demand right now. Um, and slowly but surely it will alleviate. And if anything, supply is going to continue to increase, right? We're seeing all this hiring right now. Supply is going to continue to go up. And it might even become a point where there's so much supply out there when demand starts to teeter off. There's actually too much supply for the existing demand. We might even see like... Stagflation. Yeah, stagflation um, in you know two or three years kind of thing because, you know... We produced all of this X, Y, and Z for your home remodels, but everyone's going back into the office and they don't have time for the home remodel anymore, that kind of thing. So, um, so you talk to all your hedge fund friends who speculate and say, do they see that coming down the line in a couple of years? From the people I've talked to, they majority of them all think that's the, the case. I, that's the consistent... Um, voice, well, quote unquote, voice of reason, right? There's going to be people who are like, oh yeah, hyperinflation, everything's going to go insane, right? There's, there are lots of those people out there, but I think the quote unquote rational investor would say, you know, based off just historical economics, this is how things are going to work, you know? Mm -hmm. There's the there's the theories and then there's the, you know, we've seen this before kind of thing, like that's probably what's going to happen. Isn't it amazing that how when you do the right thing and you pay off your debts, you pay off your credit cards, your home, you know, all your student loans and whatnot, that that should be what everybody should do. And the other side of it is, well, if everybody did that, does that stagnate the economy? Because isn't it all financed on debt? So you being in debt actually helps the economy keep chugging along. Right. I mean, we are the U.S., luckily, actually not anymore, is uh, I would have said we're a consumer economy, but we're more of a service economy now. Mm. I think okay. that's one of the biggest things that differentiates uh, developed economies um, because uh, India, China, those are consumer economies where uh, spe specifically Korea, 
is a huge consumer economy. They, people save up money just to buy new scarves and stuff uh, in Korea. So Yeah, you've seen Squid Game? Yeah, what happens right, you, Squid Game, exactly. What happens when you get into debt? <laughs> so um, oh. there are a lot of major consumer um, economies out there. Not to say the U.S. doesn't consume anymore, but the U.S. itself, the U.S. economy does not make a majority of its money anymore from uh, consumption goods because we're not producing consumption goods anymore. We, we make them in China, that kind of thing. So China is the consumption good market. America is the service country, right? Because a lot of our, uh, the things we buy these days are services, like a contractor, that's a service actually. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of raw materials and goods in that, but you're, you're buying a service. Um, most countries and a lot of big firms now use us for consulting. Um, a lot of our, a lot of money goes into um, data and marketing and things like that, like big data, you know, and data warehouses and so on and so forth. Those are all consumer, those are all quote unquote consumer goods. Uh, or, not, or those are, sorry, those are all services. Having those data centers and things like that and, and having your Netflix account, right? That's a, that's a service. That's not like a feasible good that you hold in your hand. So um, the U.S. has really shifted to more of a service model than a consumer goods model. Even though we consume many goods, we don't sell many goods. We sell services. I never thought about that. I just kind of assumed, you know, going back 20 years that, you know, we were, if it takes us to spend money in order to keep on going, but it's more like now we're selling our knowledge, I guess you want to call it. Yeah. And that's what's keeping the economy going or keeping I mean, that, us. That's a huge portion of it, which is, you know, like a lot of our huge tech firms have actually led us down that service route, which is now the U.S. is kind of like the forefront for technology and big data and a lot of those and a lot of those ideas. So a lot of other countries come to us and say, hey, you know, like we're going to go to your consulting firms and use your knowledge and expertise. We're going to buy your services to help us grow our economy and so on and so forth. Um, and then, you know, we're producing, I guess, movies and a lot of our media might be considered a consumption. But, you know, when you put it on a streaming service, that streaming service is a service. Hmm. Right. So. Um, yeah, we were just slowly becoming a very service-based um, economy. Even, even our food is turning is 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 migrating from a consumption to a service because we're buying meal prep. Wow, you're right. It's, I mean, that's a service. I mean, it comes with goods, right? But but you're paying the additional money for a service, you know, to, or Instacart, right? That's a you know, sometimes, um, you know, you sign, you, you do like a monthly, I think Instacart has like a, like a service system, right? Where they take off all the um, delivery fees. Probably. You know, I like mean, if you're like the gold member, right? It, even our food and things these days is being turned into a service. So all these venture capitalists that dump money into Uber Eats and Grubhub and not making a profit, they see something that none of us else do. Like, hey, we're changing the culture. And yeah. And eventually I, we're going to make money. But right now we're changing the mindset. And it's funny, the, the culture that you're thinking of is um, actually, like, you know, been tested. It's that um, a lot of people consider services to be cheaper. So paying your five, you know, paying $5 a month for Spotify or something like I have $5. I can do that. You know, if you were to say, can you do you want to pay like, you know, five cents a song? You're like, well, what if that adds up? I don't know what the end number is going to be, but $5 a month. Oh, I can do $5 a month. You know, um, that's very deep psychological insight there. I never would have if, thought about that. If, if you were to I'm add, so it. one mm -hmm. of the things that it's kind of, it's kind of funny is if you were to add up all of the services you pay for, right? Your internet, your Netflix, all those things, you're going to realize that it actually makes up a huge chunk of your monthly expenses is just services. It's not goods anymore. It used to be that you b went and rented a movie or you bought a movie. You don't buy any movies anymore. You're right. you, you use a streaming service. So Jeez, yeah. our, our level of consumer goods has decreased a whole lot because we're getting them through services now. And, it's, and, it's, and people feel much more comfortable paying a set amount because people pay, and this actually is a huge concept uh in in risk management and in investing in general is people pay for certainty i mean 
kind of makes sense. If, I want to know where my money's going in 20 years, right? Right. Um, there's this concept called uh, the, the rational investor and that all investors and all people are, not all, but a majority of people are what we call risk averse, which is uh, given to outcomes um, that have the same expected value, a individual will pick the one that is always certain. So if I said, um, I can give you $5 or I can flip a coin and if it's heads, you get $10. If it's tails, you get $0. Hmm. Well, the flipping a coin 50, 50 has an expected value of $5, right? 50% of $10. Right. So that's yeah. five, 50% of zero is still zero. So that has an expected value of five. So technically they're worth the same thing, but one is certain and the other one is not. Mm. That's so way to look at it. someone who has no concept of risk would say, oh, these two things are equal. But the concept of risk, right, in your life, you're going to go, no, I'll just pick the certain $5. I, you know, even in my own head, I probably would more times than not, unless I had nothing to lose. If it was like I could flip a coin, either take it all or nothing. But <laughs> we could jump nothing. into that too. There's, there's a wealth gap, right, which is if you're incredibly – uh, it, it's funny if you're very, very poor, then you might go for the coin flip because you have nothing to lose, right? You'd rather have more wealth than, uh, than a little wealth. So I would have thought. It'd be so the that's, that's like, you know, somebody who, um, you know, that's why someone who makes minimum wage might go buy lottery tickets. See, Cause I, you're, you're willing to lose a little wealth for the concept of getting a huge amount of wealth. See, I would have thought it's the opposite. Like, give me a certain $5 so I can pay the bills compared to if I'm swimming in billions of dollars, I have no clue what to do with. Sure, I'll take a coin flip. I get that yeah. rush. And then that's maybe that's how the wealthy get even wealthier. I have nothing to lose. I so, have so much money. So that and that's the opposite side of it, which is you have the incredibly wealthy people who are like, yeah, you know, I, I don't need the extra $5. So I'll just make the bet to get 10. Um, yeah. It's what casinos thrive on, right? It's like if you're spending a ton of money at the Bellagio and at the craps table, ideally you're somebody who's got money to lose, not somebody who's indebted to the casino. So, you know, you'd rather pay for that rush of winning big as opposed to, okay, I'll take the certain bet, but it's not really that exciting. You know, I already got enough money. Well, casinos probably off the person who, who likes flipping the coin. <laughs> yeah. Like, um, on, but... The, the average person, when given the choice of certain $5 or probability of $5, will go with the certain choice of $5. So that's where the streaming services come in, which is, well, I don't know how much I would spend versus it's a set amount I'm going to spend this much. Gotcha. Okay. Even for your food, I don't know how much I'm going to spend on food this month, but if I use a meal prep service, I know I'm going to spend exactly this much. Wow. The, <laughs> me Maybe it's just our ge a generation because I would look at that as – how can I save? Maybe if I go to the store, I buy all this stuff here. I can make the same amount here, but it's going to cost me time. I got to actually be in the kitchen and cut this up and measure that and put that together. Or I could pay a little bit more and have somebody else do it for me. And I'm buying time, essentially, in that yeah, case. Yeah, you know, and, and that's another, you know, piece of it is, is the value of that service, right? Because if, if you didn't think that service was valuable, you wouldn't buy it, obviously. Right. You know, so there has to be value associated with it. But you know, it's, it's, the, it's the certainty in, in, in the value. That's, I mean, that makes so much sense now because if you would have asked me a couple of years ago, I said, you know, DoorDash, Grubhub, they got no shot. Who's going to pay to have somebody deliver McDonald's to them when you can just go down the street and get it? And what well, was I wrong? People are paying that $5. Well, that's, <laughs> that's just the service of, <laughs> I'm too lazy if you ask me. Um, <laughs> but like, if you're one of those people who uses the meal prep or something like that, or, um, I don't know, like even like a butcher's box, right? You're buying a whole bunch of steak or something like that. Yeah. Um, if I was to ask you, what's the price of beef right now? I have no clue. Exactly. You, you have no idea. So you, you see this butcher box and maybe it's on sale or something on there. And yeah. It's like, oh, well, I, at least I know I can get my ground beef and everything on a, you know, monthly basis for this exact amount. I don't know what it is at the, or what the quality is at the, um, at the local butcher's, you know, shop, but. I could just get it here really simply. And it's a matter of one, not having to get up. So there's that, you know, value added there. And two, it's, you know, like I, it's, you know, it's, it's simplified. That's, it's, you get that, you get that certainty out of it. That clears up a lot. Now this, the whole idea that we are more of a service dominated or we sell services. Now you're right. Google, Facebook, YouTube, 
everything around within a 10 mile radius from here. It's all stuff that is just a service that's provided to people as opposed to we manufacture a product. I guess is why we don't make cars in this country anymore or why we do, but not nearly like we did 50 years ago. Oh yeah. And it's all, you're right. It's all stuff that we create this platform and then we sell it to you as another country. You pay for our service. You pay for our skills to help you get better while you, you're the ones who actually physically make the products. Yeah. And even products these days come with quote unquote services. Like I, I, I guess there's a lot of people who, you know, go to the grocery store and they buy, you know, buy a bottle of wine, but usually you always buy the bottle of wine, you know, you know, a lot of people go to the consistent thing. There's some people who pick the random ones, things like that. But like if you're, but you know, if people go, if you go up to Napa, right, you're not going to go into a grocery store in Napa and pick a random bottle of wine, right? You're going to go do a tasting and that's a service. And then you're going to buy the wine. Yeah. And if you like it, you'll keep buying it kind of thing. So a lot of services these days are, or a lot of products these days are even attached to a service that helps you remember that product. You're right. Like almost, I would rather, sounds bad to say it, I would rather go to a wine tasting experience, try different wines, and then buy the one I like that's maybe 50 bucks. When if I actually thought about it for a second, maybe that same bottle or the same blend is at the local market for 10 bucks. But I'm paying because it's, it's the experience of going into this really cool environment with the fireplace and the people explaining it to you that yeah. I'm okay spending the extra 35 bucks or whatever for the same exact wine. That's, yeah. man, that's real. Again. Because you know you like it because you just tasted it. Yes, the you're certainty right. That also, you know, you come back to a little bit. Correct. Okay. Well, that helps me out a lot. And as I plan a more financial <laughs> future here, like, wow. And it makes sense why people do the things that, that they actually do you know, Spotify, I spend $5 a month, you know, I know I'm only paying $5 a month, but if you ask me to, the old thing with Apple iTunes was you'd have to buy a song every time you wanted to get it, or you can just buy Apple iMusic now or whatever it's called for $10 a month and you can download all the songs for free, but all included. Yeah. So it's like, yeah, I'll do that as opposed to maybe I'll buy one song or two songs a month and it'll be cheaper. But this way, at least I know I only pay 10. I could download as many as I want, even though I know I probably never will download that many i i do want to say this when you were talking about you know as i look at my spending um i heard this quote from shack which you know someone it's told it be good i know it's right it's from, it's from shack it's gotta be good um and i i think i'll add on my own you know a little saying to this but um shack you know was meeting with an investor or was meeting with like a wealth manager or somebody once and uh the guy told him um uh, you know what the difference is between being rich and being wealthy? And Shaq's like, what? And the guy goes, so a rich person, you know, does this, takes out a dollar, you know, metaphorically rips the dollar in half. And he goes, rich person goes and saves this. The wealthy person takes the other half of the dollar, rips that. He goes, he saves this portion as well. All right. And so what I like to think is, um, uh, if, if you've watched the movie Crazy Rich Asians, right, there's this there's this part where, you know, they're in first class. And she's like, is your family rich? And he's like, we're, we're comfortable. comfortable. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> we're comfortable. Um, and when I hear someone say that, I think, okay, well, yeah, they probably have a lot of money. You know, like what she said, like, that's what rich people say. Um, but there is the wealthy person that goes to the store and they use coupons. Right, they could be a millionaire, and mm-hmm. they're using coupons, and that's how they create generational wealth. Is they have a million dollars and they're still using coupons? It's the it, when I think of someone who's truly wealthy, I think they're comfortable because all they want to do is live comfortably. Interesting. Okay, so just so I, the rich person takes a dollar bill, tears it in half, he saves one half and he spends the other half. Yep. And the wealthy person takes that same dollar, rips it in half, saves one half, and then what does he do with this half? Spend it? He, he takes the second half, he rips it again. Oh, uh, okay. So he rips one half, saves it. With right, the other so half, he's, he rips saving, it again. he's saving three-fourths of it and spending one-fourth versus the rich person is spending ha- is, you know, saving half and spending the other half. Wow, that's a So <laughs> when I think it. of you know, people who come to First Republic for Wealth Management Services, right, you know, a lot of them are not people who – um, were necessarily born into wealth or something like that. They're the person who worked really hard and 
they saved and saved and saved and now you know they're in their 40s and they have 1.2 million and by the time they hit their 60s you know another 20 years they're gonna have you know two three million you know saved up and you think that's a huge amount of money and it's and it is um but it was purely the it was purely discipline that got them there right and Hmm. when i think of someone who's like you know says they're they're comfortable that's that person who doesn't buy the ferrari they go even though they could they go and they buy a honda you know maybe they maybe they get all the bells and the whistles in the honda or something yeah. like that right you, you gotta know spoil yourself somewhere they, they, you gotta spoil yourself so you know themselves in some way exactly but you know that's the thing is they you know you'll see that they have a modestly sized home but maybe they have nice furniture mm-hmm. right because they they spend their money on quality things that they know are going to last Right, so they have a modest home, but they've got like you know nice furniture, a nice you know tableware set, or something like that. So it's the it's the people who you know they look for the value, right? And they they and they're disciplined about their spending. So they're going to say, I'm going to you know spend my money on this because I know it's going to last me for a very long time. And like I said before, you know they go to the grocery store and they buy the stuff that's on sale, even though they don't need to. They do it because they just want to live comfortably. And because of that, their kids will live comfortably. That's probably the key there, too. What do you think about that whole idea? Because there's a debate. It's subjective, and I get it. But there's a debate on if you are somebody who has been very smart with your money and you have children 30, 40 years, you know, your kids are 20 years years old at this point, and you saved up a, a, quite a lot of amount of money, a lot of the uh, the idea was, this money I'm not going to use, but it's for my kids so they can go have a, you know, have a good life and do what they want to do. Do you see more where that, is that something that we should be doing is we do the work and give our kids the money or should it be we do the work? I need to teach my kids how to do it so they know how to appreciate it going forward as opposed to me giving them the blank check and maybe they don't know how to spend it. I, Warren Buffett, I think, said that too, where he's only going to give his kids Enough like money. a certain amount of money. Yeah, yeah, but not enough to go crazy with. And then you got someone like Daniel Craig, the James Bond actor, who said, oh, my kids are getting nothing. Right, yeah. I. One thing that you'll notice about both Daniel Craig and Warren Buffett is, uh, you know, when it comes to their kids, they'll pay for 100% of their kids' medical and education. Mm-hmm. That's very common, right? Because they want their kids to succeed. And I think this is a great way of parenting, which is like, yeah, you want your kids to succeed. You want to give them the resources they need to, to succeed. So if that's education, right, you, you pay for their college degree, that kind of thing. Uh, but the kids want some spending money to go do stuff in college. Like, that's on them, you know? That was how it was with my parents. My parents helped me with my um, tuition. Mm-hmm. Um, but anything else, that was, uh, that was me. See, I'd argue that'd be the best way, way, way to do it is to have enough money so you can pay for your kids' basics, the education, the medical, yep. uh, and while they're in school, maybe some basic food. But if you want to go party, if you want to go to the club, you want to go with your friends on a road trip to Miami, that comes out of your pocket. You better find, find a job. And it's funny, if you think of it that way, does that mean that some of us who work so hard to accrue all this, this money for our kids, maybe it's like, we don't need that much money for them. We're giving them enough to be able to find their own way. Do we have to spend 90 hours in the office because we want to get that extra zero in the account or not? So it's, it's funny because um, I went to like a, I went to an all boys Episcopalian private school, like, you know, high school growing up. Sounds and fun. so I, yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so, there's definitely the difference between kids who got it all and kids who, you know, like, you know, uh, you know, their parents might be loaded kind of thing, but, uh, but we're incredibly humble. Mm -hmm. Right. And so you, so like, I would say it only took like 10 minutes of talking to somebody before you're like, Oh, you're, you're this kind of person, you know, like you grew up this way kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Cause there was like, the incredibly t- entitled or, you know, like I own the world people. And then there's the guys who are like, yeah, no, I got to work hard. Even though they know in their future, maybe they don't have to work. They know in the back of their minds, that's, that's not their wealth. They didn't do anything to deserve that. Very good. Yeah. And they are like, Hey, 
I'll build on this so my kids, you know, can, you know, so their college can be paid for or so on and so forth. Um, or, you know, like if my kids ever want to, you know, buy a home, which is incredibly difficult, right. They can do that earlier than a lot of people, you know, that's, that's very common. But, um, uh, but I think, you know, the difference with a lot of these guys, because they'll come in and they'll say, no, I need to make my own path. Like I need to, I need to make my own wealth. I need to do that. You know, I need to kind of like go my own, my own route and create my own story versus just living off of the legacy. Um, yeah. so and you, in my opinion, you can, you know, that very quickly, you know, when you you were talking to somebody because, you know, don't know if you want to edit this out, but that's the difference between talking to someone who's cool and talking to someone who's a dick. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you, we'll you know that dick life. who just like has a bunch of money and he's just like, yeah, fuck, whatever, you know? <laughs> so, you know, that guy. Um, and it's like, that's the guy I, I would never hang out with, you know, cause there, there was that guy. And then there's the guy who, you know, he, he lives comfortably, yeah. but right. that doesn't mean that he's going to go flaunt his money. He's going to do whatever. He's going to try and make his own path. See, I think that some of the people in our generation, as we have kids or we're going to have kids or whatnot in the future, that knowing that now that I want to make sure we have enough money to take care of my child's physical needs and also they have money so they can go, go to college after high school so they can get their education. But, you know, the idea that I have to always accrue so much wealth beyond that just to be able to say I've, I've accrued it. In the meantime, I'm spending so much time in the office or wherever traveling that I'm not spending enough time with my family and actually enjoying that all because I'm chasing a bigger number. The bigger number that I get in the bank, the better off my kids are going to be. And then, I mean, I've, I've seen that with some of the older generations who it was different wealth. It was not the wealth. It's not tech money wealth now, but. Yeah. I mean, that's where I think it goes back to a little bit of that comfortable thing, you know, where it's like, um, you know, there's the person who, you know, they, I, I say, I would like to say that they pick their items to splurge on, mm -hmm. you know, there's some people who like going on big, nice family vacations. Uh, I have, um, a cousin who, um, is, um, at a pretty prominent position in Porsche. Uh, and he spends, I want to say most of his money, uh, going on really nice vacations with his wife. Can we say how prominent in Porsche? Uh, so we'll leave that out. <laughs> he, d he designs not the cars, but he designs their buildings. That's still pretty prominent. So if there's like a new factory or something, he drives the blueprints for it <laughs> or a new office, right? That's, that's him. Um, I don't know, I'm trying to not sure if that's all him, but he, he you know, it's all him. Yeah. <laughs> they give him a, a company car every year, which I'm jealous about. Oh, boy. <laughs> but, you know, like, uh, I happen to know that, like, you know, he has he has an egg and toast for breakfast each morning. Like a single egg and some, you know, jam and butter toast. Uh, you know, very simple home, um, very simple living. You know, like, they, they do go out to eat a lot because they're not very great cooks. Um, but, you know, like, you know, most of the time they go down to the local market and, you know, you know, haggle for their goods kind of thing. You know, like, they, you know, they, they live like the comfortable life. But then they go on vacation and, you know, they're going to go on like a really luxurious cruise or stay in really nice hotels. You know, like that's their one splurge item is they like their vacations. So, um, yeah, I, I think there are those people who try to save up a whole bunch of money. And for those people, I say, awesome, good for you. You know, you're saving. Um, you know, but it, it's a little retrospect. Sometimes you look back and you're like, oh, I wish I'd spent more time with my family. So I would say, um, there's two forms of wealth. There's the, the wealth that you accumulate in an account. And then, you know, there's the, uh, quality of your life Yeah. and you know, there's wealth in your human capital and you. And so if you personally don't feel very wealthy, you're probably doing something a little wrong. Yeah. I think it was Denzel Washington who said this at some uh, commencement speech. He's like, I forgot what university. He's like, you'll never see a U-Haul driving behind a Hearst. Motto being, you can't take it with you. So yeah. do you want to spend so much time just focusing on getting this specific career and getting a specific as much money as you can accumulate thinking you're going to give it to your kids and it's going to be all well and good. But at the same time, 
sacrifice spending time with the family and then maybe they grow up not knowing who you are because you've been on the road so much traveling and making money but you know never had that other real family bond because we started chasing too much of what wasn't as important to us later on in life yeah when I, when I, um, my work did one of those things where, um, they did like that employee assessment where it's like, where do you find value, so to say? Mm -hmm. And some people are like, well, I feel value if someone says I'm appreciated. I feel value if, um, uh, you know, if you pay me more, that kind of thing. And it's like, well, yeah, I will feel value if you pay me more. That's always great. Yeah. Um, but you know, for, for me, I was like, give me more vacation days. You know, like I, I, there's, in my opinion, two career paths you can go down. One where you live to work and one where you work to live. Everyone likes to you know, enjoy their work, which I think is important. Um, but there are people who their lives are their careers, like a doctor. Yeah. Right? Like yeah. you don't go into medicine necessarily for the money. You, you go into the medicine because you want to help people. You want to save lives, things like that. Or your parents right. told you you should be a doctor. Or your parents <laughs> told you should be you should be a doctor, but you stay for that reason. Yes. Um, yes. Hopefully, you stayed for that reason, um, not just despite your parents. Um, so, in, in my situation, right, my, I, li I like my job. You know, I like people I work with. Um, but if you said, would you rather be going doing your job, or would you rather, you know? spend time at home and go on and, you know, go on vacation or something. Well, I'm, I'm going to go on vacation and that kind of stuff, yeah. you know, and, I, and I'm not going to feel guilty at all about not working. You know, a doctor might feel guilty that he's not helping any of his patients. I'm not going to feel guilty about my, about my job. So <laughs> about, you know, not, not doing my job. So, um, yeah, I, I think that's something, you know, once again, there's any younger people watching this, I'd always think like, well, do you want a career where you live to work or you work to, to live your life kind of thing? And then that's one important concept. And the other thing is there's a lot of people out there who focus on a specific degree or maybe they choose one career path. Um, and I got this advice really early on in my life and I thought it was super important because I thought I wanted to go down the investment banking route and that was like the only route that I wanted to go down kind of thing. And the guy said to me, um, he said, you know, picture yourself driving into work um, and what does your office look like and what do people in your office say about you? Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, I don't want to be on the ground floor. I want to be like in the middle of the building kind of thing. And I want people to, you know, say, and, and I, I gave him kind of like attributes, like he's reliable, you know, he, he does a good job, uh, so on and so forth. And he goes, cool. So, you want a job where, you know, you're, you're important, you get valued by your peers, and um, you can be seen as someone who's, you know, like trustworthy and get things done, you know, all these different things. And he goes, so does it matter what job you're doing if hmm. you're meeting what you just said? And I was like, well, not really. And he's like, great. So you could be, instead of in finance, you could be in marketing you could be in sales, you could, you could do anything. But as long as you know, you're, you're checking off these boxes, you know, these like appreciation boxes, you're getting paid the salary and, and you're getting the respect you want, you could be doing anything right. And I was like, uh, well, yeah, I, I could be doing anything. He's like, great. So don't let, you know, one defined career path define you or don't let, you know, one set of skills specifically define you. If you find a good opportunity somewhere and, and you think you're going to enjoy it and, you know, and you're going to check all these boxes, go do that. Sounds like the words of a wise man or person, whoever they were. He was 34. It was pretty funny. <laughs> he got that advice from someone else, though, you know, so it's just, it just passing it down. But uh, how's he doing now? Uh, I do not know. I don't talk to many people from my prior employer. I uh, got you. OK. <laughs> Except for the people who were in my role. And then we laugh about how much we didn't like it. <laughs> I mean, it's good advice. A lot of us are told in our 20s, especially in that kind of industry, Hey, it's a, it's a dog fight here. You're going to come in, you're going to hustle, you're going to work 80 hours a week and you're going to like it because that's what you got to do in order to get to this position that you think you want. And we're going to go, go into blindly speaking of blindly. And we just realize it's actually not that important as much as it is. If 
I can actually have a work-life balance. Yes, money is important to the, to, the, to, the, to the extent that I have enough money to pay the bills. But beyond that, you know, is it worth spending 90 hours a week at a job that I really didn't care about as much compared to 40 hours a week at a job that may doesn't make as much, much money, but I'm happier and I have more time with the family and all the other things I want to do. Yeah. It's funny how we don't know that at like age 20 or 25. For, for anybody who's young and who's working those like 80 hour weeks and so on and so forth, um, I would not say, I guess, and I, I've even said this myself that, you know, like you're paying your dues. Um, but I would look at it more as instead of paying your dues, it's more like um, you're becoming an expert. Because you're working those 80 hour weeks, you're working crazy hours, things like that. Um, it's probably not doing something new, like, you know, like repeating the exact same thing over and over again. You're doing something that's probably the same process, right? But, you know, a little different, so on and so forth. Like you're making, you know, XYZ PowerPoints a week or whatever the case, or you're having to research XYZ companies, you know, per day or, you know, per week, whatever the case. Um, you're putting in a lot of hours, but you're becoming an expert in something so that when you do move on to your next, you know, role, your next line, you know, the thing that used to take you a week to do or a couple of days to do or whatever the case, it now takes you like an hour for me, right? Like making a, uh, you know, making a dashboard to, you know, give to executive management or something. And you used to be like, oh, okay, I got to figure out the SQL to write. And then I got to figure out how best to present the and lay out the information into my dashboard and so on and so forth. And then it used to be like, okay, well, it'll take me like a day to make a dashboard kind of thing. Mm. Somebody uh, on my team reached out to me and they're like, I I'd love to see like XYZ information. You know, like, is there any way, you know, over the next like week or two, you can kind of like create something or get this to me? And I was like, huh, over the week or two, I'll send you in an hour. <laughs> You know, like something that used to take me a day, you know, now, to, now I'm just like, throw that in there, make the graph look like this. They probably want this kind of functionality. Let me throw that in really quick. And then I, I just pop it back out and it's done. So, you know, like that 80 hour grind, you know, like it, you're learning yeah. for anyone who's, who's, you know, doing those long hours, doing all those Excel spreadsheets. I would say you're learning and think of it as learning. So if you can improve your current process, if you can ref refine the steps that you're taking, do that because that's how you improve, you know, like, you know, that trial or paying your due phase is your learning phase. Cause college is great for college is great. Uh, when it comes to you learning how to solve problems that you're doing, that's what you're doing in college. You're learning the basics, but the biggest yes. thing you're learning is problem solving. Right. So when you get into the real world, right, you're starting from scratch because most colleges don't give you real world examples. Some of them do. Some of them are really great about that. But a majority of the time, you know, like even if you're a Stanford student, right, like you get into the real world and you think you're all awesome and great because you graduated from Stanford. But the reality is you haven't worked yet. And so now you're going to work and now you're going to realize what goes into working because um, I think one of the greatest examples is you might give a presentation or you might, you know, turn in, um, you know, something in a class and you get a A minus or a B plus on it. And you think, well, that's really good, right? Maybe there was like a little spelling error in it, or maybe one of your little graphs was, didn't make sense or was off. Right. Um, but you know, B plus was, was good. you you were, you were happy with that. Um, if I make a dashboard or if I make some sort of report, and there's a spelling error in it, and one of the graphs is off, uh, and that report is supposed to go to executive management, my boss is going to look at me like, what the hell are you doing? You spelled X, Y, Z wrong? Like, our CRO is going to see this. You know, like, I can't present this, right? The, so in school, there's, that was good enough. In the workforce, there is attention to detail, and there's only one right answer. We, our schools don't have one right answer. We have a grading system. And <laughs> and the workforce, there's a yes, no grade. There's no, and then and the yes is like the 100% pass. Correct. Especially in that industry. And the other piece of advice might be when you get that first job, don't buy the Porsche. Not yet. <laughs> no need, need to flash because now It's okay if you live with your parents. Trust okay. me. Yeah. 
Because you, you're just saying, <laughs> trust me. Yeah, your life doesn't really start till you're about 27 or 28 anyway. That's in the low end now. But, but if um, you're living with your parents, that's not an excuse to spend all your money and go do crazy things. Yeah, despite what social media would actually tell you. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Words of wisdom. Mike, this was exciting. This, we're at an hour and a half. Time okay. flew by, right? Yeah. It was awesome. I learned a lot about that industry. I learned a lot about how much we are a culture or an economy of services now compared to consuming goods or consumer goods or producing goods, I should say. That was mind-blowing. Never thought about it. Never thought about the whole streaming service and how that's actually the little things that we do now that you know people way smarter than, than, than us kind of figured out a long time ago, and they're already out on top of it making the big bucks, so good for them. Exciting stuff, man. So yeah. if someone wanted to reach out to you for your advice or to become a client of your industry, how can they reach out to you? Email, Instagram, what uh, do you got? Yeah, I, I'd have to be email because I don't have an Instagram. <laughs> well, good. You haven't joined the club yet. I Stay that yeah, way. Yeah, I refuse to, to do the Instagram or the Twitter. I, I already spend my uh, enough time you know, wasted on other things. TikTok, I, I deleted, I had to uninstall my TikTok. After I sat there for an hour watching videos, I was like, oh my God, I have so much better things to do in my life right now. Like, exactly. <laughs> this is addicting. It's got to go. What's your email? Um, people can reach out to me at um, Michael period C as in cat, E as in elephant, period Roth. That's R O T H, the number two at Gmail. No relation to who created the Roth IRA, right? No, it's especially in the finance industry. That's the first thing everyone asks me. Like, so are you with that? Like, no, no, not even, not no. me. <laughs> I wouldn't be working if that was the case. <laughs> exactly. You wouldn't be because you'd have I wouldn't that need to work. generational wealth right there. Yeah. See? All right, Mike, this is Or at least I'd be working in a way bigger, like hedge fund or something with all the, the connections are real when you're at that level. <laughs> Hey, your, your name's on it. Why not? I know, right? So It was I exciting should, stuff. I start putting that in my resume related to the Roth IRA. <laughs> yes. Well, we got to do, do this again because there's a lot more knowledge there that we didn't get to today that we could definitely pick upon another day. Yeah. Sound good? Part two is fine with me. All right, Mike. Thanks for coming on. And anybody who's watching this, please like the video and subscribe to the channel. By liking the video, that's what allows YouTube to generate interest or it generates interest for YouTube, which then gets it out to the masses when more people like the video. So I appreciate that. Thank you, Mike Roth. And that was a very exciting show. Everybody take care. Thanks.